This is the Earth, our planet, home to millions of different species. But only one species dominates everything. Human beings. There are nearly seven billion of us living on the Earth. And the human population is increasing by more than two people every second. 200,000 people every day. Nearly 80 million people every year. Each additional life needs food, energy, water, shelter, and hopefully a whole lot more. Today, we're living in an era in which the biggest threat to human well-being, to other species, and to the Earth as we know it, might well be ourselves. The issue of population size is always controversial because it touches on the most personal decisions we make. But we ignore it at our peril. There's absolutely no doubt at all that the world's population will continue to grow. The only question is, by how much? More than a billion people on the planet already lack access to safe, clean drinking water. And we know things are going to get more difficult as the population continues to grow. We need to double the amount of food that we have available to us as soon as possible. Such a scale of change will leave no one untouched. Keep in mind that when the Titanic sank, the first class cabins went to the bottom just as quickly as the steerage. I was born into a world of just under two billion people. Today, there are nearly seven billion of us. Whenever I hear those numbers, I can honestly say I find it incredible, triple the number of human beings in what seems like the blink of an eye, and the world transformed utterly. Human population density is a factor in every environmental problem I've ever encountered. From urban sprawl to urban overcrowding. Disappearing tropical forests to ugly sinks of plastic waste. And now, the relentless increase of atmospheric pollution. I've spent much of the last 50 years seeking wilderness, filming animals in their natural habitat and, to some extent, avoiding humans. But over the years, true wilderness has become harder to find. I can't pretend that I got involved with filming a natural world 50 years ago because I had some great banner to carry about conservation. Not at all. I, I uh, have always had a huge pleasure in, in just watching the natural world and seeing what happens. I made those films because it was a hugely enjoyable thing to do. Um, but as I went on making them, uh, it became more and more apparent that the creatures which were giving me so much joy uh, were under threat. The fun is in delighting in the, in the animals. Uh, but if you do that, you, you owe them something. And so you have an obligation to speak out and do what you can to help protect them. I support a group called the Optimum Population Trust, which campaigns to reduce birth rates. Because I think if we keep on growing, we're not only going to damage nature, but we're likely to see more and more inequality and human suffering. In this program, I want to see how population growth will affect our ability to obtain our most basic needs, water, food, and energy and to see if it's possible to answer the question, how many people can live on planet Earth? Human beings are good at many things, but thinking about our species as a whole is not one of our strong points. I don't even think I could tell you how many people live in this country. <laughs> a Google? Yeah, 
I would say Google. I know India's population is 1.1 billion, but I don't know the population of the world. I'd say 6 billion off the top of my head. I've got no idea how many people live on the planet. No idea. Luckily, the size of the human population is studied very closely. By and large, every human birth and death throughout the world has been recorded for the last 60 years. The data is kept here in New York City at the United Nations. Hania Zlotnik, head of the UN Population Division, is in charge of those precious numbers. This was the old type of working. When I arrived here at this United Nations, I worked with these types of files, you see. They're very well organized, but they look old. <laughs> so now we do it via computer, and it's somehow it's not the same thing as feeling the data. <laughs> so I am a numbers person, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. My mission is to be the bean counter. That means we are the thermometer telling you, well, the, the, the planet is getting hot or cold in terms of population change. The UN do much more than just keep records. They make projections into the future, and their figures are staggering. The human population is still growing. One expects that at the very least it's likely to add about 2.3 billion people by the, by the middle of the century. We have 6.8 billion today. We're expecting to get the 7th billion in the next three, four years. And then we're expecting that by mid-century we will have something like 9 billion. In the next 40 years, the Earth will need to accommodate nearly 3 billion more people. That's more than the current population of the whole of Europe, the whole of Africa, North and South America combined. How can we be so sure of this prediction? Well, we know that there are more than a billion teenagers alive today, and most of those teenagers will have children of their own and live long enough to become grandparents. And that's all that needs to happen for there to be nine billion humans alive in 2050. It's not people having huge families. It's just a lot of people doing what humans naturally do. We also have a good idea of where these additional people will live. There are likely to be 10 million more people in Britain, 100 million more in the United States of America. India will overtake China to become the most populous country in the world. The population of some countries will shrink. Japan, Russia, Germany and much of Eastern Europe. The places that will experience the most rapid growth are also the least developed countries in the world. Afghanistan's population will double. Most of sub-Saharan Africa will double. Niger's population is predicted to more than triple. I think everyone living through the next 50 years is going to be affected by these demographic changes wherever they are. For most of human existence, our population size was kept in check by nature, just as it is for other animals. If there's plenty of water, food and materials for shelter, a population will thrive. But when disease, famine or drought strike, life can be cut short. The history of humanity is one of overcoming these environmental limits but it took us a very long time to achieve. On the horizontal axis here, we have time over the last 10,000 years. On the vertical axis here, we have the size of the human population uh, in billions of people. Over the last 10,000 years, in general, there's been very little change. It's a very boring picture. But from about the year 1800 onwards, you have a major increase, a very large increase in the world's population from about 1 billion up to 7 billion today. Basically, what this um, increase in population represents is um, 
control of death rates. Death rates have been reduced um, because um, infectious diseases, um, cholera, smallpox, malaria, um, measles, those sorts of things have been massively reduced. On average, for almost all of human history, um, a man and a woman were only survived into adulthood by two of their children. And basically, that's why the world's population didn't increase. Extending life by controlling disease is perhaps one of the greatest achievements of humanity. I was born in a world of two and a half billion, and I'm seeing it almost triple in my lifetime. And life has not gotten worse. In fact, for most of the population of the world, I've had, life has gotten better in these 50 years. Living healthily and long has consequences. Population growth. Just as the human population was starting its unprecedented growth spurt in the late 18th century, this was published. It's a first edition of an essay on population by the English clergyman Thomas Malthus. Malthus made a very simple observation about the relationship between humans and resources and used it to look into the future. He pointed out that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Food production can't increase as rapidly as human reproduction. Demand will eventually outstrip supply. Malthus goes on to say, if we don't control human reproduction voluntarily, life could end in misery, which earned him a reputation as a bit of a pessimist. But Malthus's principle remains true. The productive capacity of the earth has physical limits, and those limits will ultimately determine how many human beings it can support. To help answer that question, we need to have an idea of what human beings need. And the people who calculate this more precisely than most are the people who are more interested in leaving the planet than staying on it. Astronauts. One of the people in charge of the well-being of astronauts on the International Space Station is Doug Hamilton. NASA, we calculate and simulate everything. If you're going to plan a rocket launch, you have to know how much food and water and uh, equipment you need to bring into space. As well as working out how much space the astronauts need, Doug and his team have to calculate their daily requirements for food, water, and breathable air. They typically need about 820 grams of oxygen, which is just a really large, large balloon, really. Um, we need about uh, four to 5,000 calories of food, uh, which is about 820 grams dry, and then need about 3.52 liters of, uh, of water, of which two and a half liters is just consumed daily. We want them to drink a lot of water, it's very good for them. And then we urinate out, and then we put that into our processing system, and we make it into drinkable water. So you might be drinking the same water molecule hundreds and hundreds of times on the space station um, because we recycle. NASA's calculations are tailored for space. But they're the same ingredients each and every one of us needs. When you see how hard it is to reproduce what Mother Nature does every day for all of us, um, you begin to really appreciate the world that you have. Whatever our technological achievements, we're still utterly reliant on the natural systems of the Earth for our very survival. By and large, the planet has provided for the human race so far. As the population has increased,